it is a tremendous blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He has granted us the gift of life and that He has granted us the gift of guidance and faith and given us the means not only of preserving our faith but of nurturing our faith and strengthening our faith and given us a way the way of our beloved messenger sallallahu alaihi wasallam that is that is a way of earning allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's pleasure and closeness in whatever circumstance one finds oneself in life that it is a way in which we seek god not only through particular acts of worship performed at particular times but it is a way in which we can seek Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and attain his good pleasure and closeness in whatever circumstance we find ourselves in life. And this is a reality mentioned by our beloved messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam who tells us mu'min that how strange are the affairs of the believer. For all their affair is for the good. And that is for no one but the true believer. That how strange is the affair of the believer? Everything that happens to them is for their good. And what does it mean that everything that happens to them is for their good? It means that whatever happens to the believer, if they act in accordance with what their belief entails, it will be good for them in their eternal standing with their Lord. Because that's what counts. And the believer is not simply someone who has belief, but is the one who lives according to belief here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out the distinction between simply having belief and living that belief. He tells us, for example, in the Quran, Ya ayyuhalladina amanu, aminu. O you who believe, believe. Why? Meaning that, O you who accept belief, live according to that belief. And if one lives according to that belief, then, as the Prophet ﷺ said, everything that happens to the believer is for their good, because they have the right response to it. In Asabathu, Sarra'a Shakara Fakana Khairallah. If pleasing things happen to them, they are thankful, and that is for their good. Wa in Asabathu Dara Sabara Fakana Khairallah. And if distressful things happen to them, they remain contentedly patient. And that too is for their good. It's for their good as a believer in that this will be a means to their earning the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's the wisdom of how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created this life. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا he is the one who has created both life and death to try you as to which of you is best in their acts. So this world is an opportunity both in the good things that happen to us and also in the trials and difficulties. And in reality, both are a test. The blessings that Allah blesses us with are bala. They are an intense test and a bala is an intense, challenging test. Just as the difficulties and distressful things, the displeasing things are a test as well. And in fact, the difficulties are a much easier test than the easy matters. Because in difficulty, anyone of even a little intelligence would realize that all you can do is turn to Allah. The true test is a test of blessing. Because few, even from the intelligent, have enough insight to recognize that in the blessing, you have to turn in thankfulness to the bestower and not be busy by the blessing away from the one who blessed you with it. And then the Prophet ﷺ gave us keys to nurture this realization of faith so that we not only preserve our faith, but can respond to the challenges of life with a heart illumined 
with the light of faith. One of the gifts from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam because every guidance that the Prophet Sallallahu gave us is a gift of mercy. He told, told us Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam I am but a gift of mercy. And every aspect of the prophetic teachings if embraced soundly and with proper understanding is a means to Allah's mercy. One of those gifts from the Prophet Sallallahu is the gift of reciting Surah Al-Fatiha on Friday, uh, Surah Al-Kahf on Fridays. This is a gift from the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And if you simply recite it and make it a regular habit, you will benefit spiritually from it even if you don't have deep understanding, deep reflection or awareness of its benefit. But if you take medicine at the right time in the right way, it'll benefit you if it's the right medicine to take. However, someone who has understanding of how you should be taking that medicine and what will facilitate you truly benefiting from that medication will benefit more from the medicine. And particularly when those spiritual medications are medications of meaning. Faith is a meaning that Allah places in the heart. So if you engage in those things that nurture faith, if you simply do it, you will find benefit. But if you practice these spiritual gifts with understanding and reflection, the spiritual benefit, the life benefit will be far greater. One of the reasons the Prophet ﷺ so strongly encouraged us to recite Surah Al-Kahf on Fridays is its direct relationship with having faith and certitude. Its direct relationship in its core message with having true faith and certitude in Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, And in the stories in Surah Al-Kahf, this clear sense of how a believer deals with the trials of life, different types of trials, worldly and spiritual, in wealth and in power and in blessing are mentioned and how you respond to them in accordance with faith so that you can live that reality that strange are the affairs of the believer for everything that happens to them is for their good because they respond to it in accordance with faith. And Surah Al-Kahf gives us guidance about living that faith and also examples, true stories in which there are lessons for those who reflect. So we should strive to adopt it as a regular practice to recite Surah Al-Kahf on Fridays. And if one is not able to recite it or you know one's recitation is slow, one has the same reward in listening to the Qur'an as one has in reciting it oneself. As long as one is paying attention to what is being recited. So if you're working on a spreadsheet at, at work, you shouldn't be listening to Qur'an because you're not giving the Qur'an its attention. But if you're driving or you're on, on your commute, etc., and you can give attention to it, then listen to it. And you'll have the same reward as reciting it yourself. And actually, when you listen to a good recitation, you can also make other intentions, such as the intention of learning proper recitation, which is a great benefit as well. That if you have a slow recitation and you listen to proficient reciters, your ability to recite will improve even if you're not reciting along. And your pronunciation will improve even if you don't pronounce it. And many of you may have noticed, if you're familiar with certain reciters, and you go to some masjid, and the imam is reciting in one of the loud prayers, you might say, his recitation is like today's, or his recitation is like so and so. Why? <coughs> if you ask the imam, that did you deliberately try to copy such and such reciter? They'll say no. We say, did you listen to them regularly? They say yes. So this is one of the benefits as well, of listening to the Qur'an. And one should just make it as part of one's routine. Whether you do it Friday, Thursday night, before Friday, or you do it Thursday morning, or before Jumu'ah, or even if you do it after Juma, or you break it up into parts, but take the means. 
And then periodically, go back and read the meanings of Surah Kahf as well. Right? So recite it or listen to it weekly, but periodically go back and listen or read its meanings, reflecting on the, the teachings of faith that this surah tells us. And one should have a goal as well, because the Prophet ﷺ emphasized the recitation of Surah Al-Kahf because of the deep lessons in it. One should have a goal that I'm going to read the tafsir of this noble surah at least once in your life. Because we've been commanded to reflect on the meanings of the Qur'an. And one can reflect on the the text or the interpretation of the text of the Qur'an, but in order to have deep reflection, one needs some depth of understanding. And that's something that is particularly important with a surah like Surah Al-Kahf that was so encouraged by the Prophet wasallam. So we should make that a commitment because the believer who is sincere about their faith should have religious goals just like they have worldly goals. People who are successful in their life. If you have a conversation with them that what are you up to these days? They'll tell you all these different things that they're planning in their worldly life. But the same person believes that they have, you know, they have religious aspirations. But you ask them, that what are your religious goals? And they'll say, well, just trying to survive as a Muslim. In your worldly life, you have goals. Why not have religious goals as well? Both things that you're aspiring towards, but also discrete steps. That, okay, I want to understand Surah Al-Kahf. How am I going to go about doing that? What are resources that I can access? What are books I can read about it? Are there scholars who've taught it and there are lesson sets available for it? If they aren't, then Alhamdulillah, should MCC perhaps have a series in which one of the local scholars is invited and they cover Surah Al-Kahf. And the whole family and families come together and individuals to, to learn that and then to make it available for, for people afterwards as well. They said Surah Al-Kahf is something that one should incorporate in one's life. But a sunnah that many people neglect with respect to Surah Al-Kahf is that the Prophet Sallallahu did not simply encourage its recitation on Fridays. He also told us that it is highly praiseworthy to recite Surah Al-Kahf each night. It's highly praiseworthy to recite Surah Al-Kahf each night, either the first 10 verses or the last 10 verses. Either the first 10 verses or the last 10 verses. And these verses encapsulate the central themes of Surah Al-Kahf. So they're a reminder of the importance of having clear faith and strength of certitude and having the, that faith being lived in the responses and choices that you make in life. The, the surah begins, Alhamdulillahilladhi anzala ala abdihi kitab All praise is due to Allah who has sent down to his servant the book وَلَمْ يَجْعَلْ لَهُ عِوَجَ and has placed no crookedness in it. It is the clear, straight path. And that enough, if one were to just reflect on this opening verse, that is guidance. What is, what is the faith? The faith is praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. There's intriguing hadiths of the Prophet ﷺ that mention, and they're in the Muslim of Ahmad and elsewhere, that saying Alhamdulillah has 30 rewards. That saying La ilaha illallah has 10 rewards, and saying Alhamdulillah has 30 rewards. Why? Because when one says Alhamdulillah, one is affirming the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but one is also affirming the reality that وَمَا بِكُمْ مِنْ نِعْمَةٍ فَمِنَ اللَّهِ That you have no blessing except that it is from Allah. This creation around you is from Allah. You are from Allah. Your life is from Allah. Your guidance, your faith, and all good you have is from Allah. <coughs> And then you, so it's an affirmation of faith and a realization of who Allah is, that He is Al Khalaq, He is the All Creating, He is Al Qayyum, the All Sustaining. And thirdly, it has the expression of thankfulness, of shukr in it. So, in that sense, it has three times the reward 
of La ilaha illallah. In that sense, though there's a lot of discussion amongst the ulama, and given the, the sum of the hadiths of the Prophet wasallam, the, the majority of the scholars say that La ilaha illallah has greater reward than Alhamdulillah, because it is the sum of all the, the deen in its meanings. But Alhamdulillah is very, very special. It is not just, oh great, Alhamdulillah. It is a statement of faith and realization and thankfulness. <laughs> Who has sent down this book in which he has placed no crookedness. So that when there's things that are confusing or dismaying, whether around one or in the world or in one's own life, Turn to that book in which there is no crookedness or confusion. And that he sent this book down <coughs> to his servant, the one who has submitted to the guidance of that book in the most beautiful of ways. Right? <laughs> All praises due to Allah who sent down to his servant the book. That he is the, the vessel and receptacle and manifestation of that which has come down from his Lord. So if you seek the guidance of the book, you must seek to connect with the example of the one who most beautifully and most perfectly embodies that guidance. And there's numerous lessons in these opening 10 verses regarding the realities of the way of faith and guidance. So it's a very practical thing that the believer is someone who acts upon their faith. The believer is an active human being. We're not passive. I'malu, Allah says, فَسَيَوْا اللَّهُ عَمَلَكُمْ وَرَسُولُهُ وَالْمُؤْمِنُونَ Say, act, and Allah will see your actions, and His Messenger will, and the believers. So when things are happening, the believer doesn't sit back and just say, okay, what's going on, and just sit back and complain. Or sit back and be an armchair pundit. Rather, as an individual and also as a community, believers look at how do we respond to what is going on in a way that will pr procure for us as individuals and as a community the good of this life and the next. And this is one of the things that was the reasons for the silence of the Prophet ﷺ. When Sayyidina Ali was asked, why was the Prophet ﷺ lengthy in silent? And he was asked by his son. Sayyidina Ali gave an incredible explanation of the silence of the Prophet ﷺ. But one of the reasons the Prophet ﷺ was lengthy in silence is that he used to reflect about what was going on. And he used to reflect on how to convey the good to his ummah and humanity in the way that would procure for them the greatest good in this life and the next. That is how we seek to inform ourselves about what's going on around us. It doesn't matter whether 1,250 or 1,500 people died in the, the factory that collapsed in Bangladesh. What matters is, what, are we, what am I going to do about it as an individual? What are we going to do about it as a community? What are we going to do about it as believers? Right? And to have the right response and to be able to make the right choices in responding to it. We are not spectators that things are going on in Syria. Just simply watching the news and sitting back that, oh well, isn't it terrible? And sitting there clicking on different pictures on Facebook of mutilated kids and just burnt out buildings. What's that going to change? Rather the question is, what am I supposed to be doing about it? There is a spiritual response and there's a life response. The spiritual response is, pray. There's a life response which is to learn a lesson. and. See what you can do as an individual. Get together with other believers and discuss. The, Sahab, the Prophet ﷺ himself strongly encouraged people to go to sleep early at night. But one of the few exceptions that he himself used to make is that he used to stay up with his close companions and most particularly with Abu Bakr Siddiq and they would be discussing the affairs of the Muslims deep into the night. And they didn't used to talk about, oh, what's going on? This as some kind of infotainment. But rather, the concern was, how can we facilitate the good? And that should be an active concern for us, both as individuals. What am I supposed to do about this? That's what the only amount of news that you should watch or listen to or read 
is the extent that is able to facilitate for you to be an agent of good and benefit for others, to inform yourself so that you are able to seek the good yourself and to facilitate the good for others, and likewise for us as communities. So this is something that we need to nurture, and Surah Al-Kahf reminds us of that, that way of faith and the way of resolve. Intriguingly, the 10th verse of Surah Al-Kahf begins by, with the mention of the story of the people of the cave. These youth who were concerned about the preservation of their faith, and what did they do? They came together and discussed how can we best preserve our faith. And in their case, the, the solution was to withdraw. The ulama took a few interesting lessons from this. One was that the Prophet's call وسلم, to read the first 10 verses was almost like an invitation to read the rest of the surah in depth. That if you read it every night, the 10th verse opens the story of the people of the cave. That it's like an invitation. Read a little more. Or also to get you ready for your weekly recitation of Surah Al-Kahf, where you're going to read the rest of the stories. But it is also a reminder to renew our commitment to live our faith. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us of those who recognize the blessing of our faith and who, may, who take the means gifted to us by the beloved Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, not only of preserving our faith, but of nurturing our faith so that we can respond to the challenges that grow around us by seeing them as opportunities of earning the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because that's what they are. They are blessings. Being in trying times, having tests and difficulties in one's life is a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we understood what a blessing it is to be tried and tested, we would celebrate our tests. If, if you lost your job, and you realize what a blessing it is that Allah has given you faith and guidance to know how to respond right to it, you'd have a celebration of thankfulness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But it's a tremendous blessing. Of course, you don't seek difficulties. You ask Allah for afiyah, for well-being. But when those challenges come, the believer smiles. Because this is an opportunity to express your love for Allah, to express your certitude in His promise, to accept this challenge with contentedness, with steadfastness, with reliance, with trust, with patience, with thankfulness, and not with their opposites, which bespeak of ignorance. And this applies to us as a community as well, that when there's these challenges, the example of the Prophet ﷺ himself, the examples given to us in Surah Al-Kahf, all tell us that when there's challenges, it is a divine imperative upon us to come together as a community and look at how we can respond to these challenges, not merely to keep our community in maintenance mode, then let's keep things going. If you ask the average Islamic center, well, what are you trying to do? Well, we're trying to keep the center running. That is a bid'ah, because the Prophet ﷺ never tried to simply maintain things. The way of the prophets is to seek the maximum of the good. And what are you trying to do? We're Allahumma inni as'aluka min al khayri kulli. Oh Allah, I ask you for the good, all of it, said the Prophet. It's immediate and it's long term. It's direct and it's indirect. What I'm aware of, the good, and what I'm unaware of. That is the prophetic way. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us individuals of concern, make us communities of concern who take everything that comes to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as an opportunity of seeking his good pleasure and then resolving to respond to it with excellence aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum fa astaghfiruhu innahu ghafurur rahim alhamdulillah rabbil alamin wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barak ala sayyidina wa nabiyyina muhammad بالقدر العظيم وعلى آله وأصحابه والتابعين والتابعين لهم بإحسان وهدى إلى يوم الدين الحمد لله We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he make us of those who are always working at nurturing faith and guidance both in our own lives and also in our communities because we do not fulfill our duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala merely by trying to live the religion ourselves but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that Allah's hand is with the group and alaykum bil jama'a be with the group 
وَإِيَّاكُمْ وَالْفُرْقَةِ And beware of going alone. For the shaitan is close to the one alone and is further from two. And the, and the Prophet ﷺ continued, مَنْ أَرَادَ بُحْبُوحَةَ الْجَنَّةِ فَلْيَلْزَمِ الْجَمَاعَةِ Whoever seeks the vast expanses of paradise, let them hold fast to the group. And this is from the amazing hadith of the Prophet ﷺ because it delineates both sticking with the mainstream in understanding but also in one's life. And this is critical in our times that, that in order to safeguard and nurture your own faith, you have no choice to go alone. You won't be able to sustain your faith just on your own. And in disconnecting times, it is critical for us to connect with community. And instead of being a passive believer, we should look at our times and do some accounting and say that, okay, let me cut out a little TV. You don't have to watch Arrested Development in 48 hours. Like you don't even have to watch it at all. Give a little time on a regular basis to volunteer at, the, at your local masjid. Give a little time to, to volunteer in some, in some worthy project that is benefiting others. Because that is a way of nurturing your own faith, of responding to the challenges that Allah has sent us in our times with others in fruitful ways as a means of seeking the pleasure of Allah. Whatever door of good Allah facilitates for you, whether it is to volunteer in some educational project, whether it is to, to, to fundraise for some charity, whether it is to go and volunteer with, with your time to, to serve the poor or the needy or the oppressed, or whether to be an advocate or to give some of your professional skills that you have to help build our community's institutions. And the best of actions are the most consistent. And these are from the lessons of looking at our life with reflection and seeing what can we do in our private lives and in our life as a member of a, of a community of believers to seek the pleasure of Allah and nurture faith by responding right to the challenges that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends us. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to send us.